Hello, welcome to this mini session from the MDT podcast team covering some of the more common issues encountered when working with older adults. Each session is structured around a clinical question and our aim is to help you approach the issue thinking like a geriatrician. The best part is that they're all under 10 minutes. I'm Alice O'Connor and I'm a teaching fellow in Surrey and I'm joined remotely by Ian Wilkinson and Joe Preston. Hi, I'm Ian Wilkinson. I'm a geriatrician in Surrey. And I'm Joe I'm a geriatrician in South London. And this session is all about the assessment and management of confusion in older people. So me, Mr. B. Wilder, is on day three of antibiotics for a urinary tract infection. His bloods are getting better, but he's still confused. <clears throat> so confusion is a really common symptom in older adults who have problems that are wrong with them, particularly if they have an infection. And when they're in hospital, that confusion can make decisions about discharge home quite difficult. So here are five things that you should try and find out, which will guide your management plan. If the person themselves is really very confused, you might need to ask some of these questions as part of a collateral history. So number one, does this person have a diagnosis of dementia or any cognitive impairment? In other words, are they normally confused at all? And this leads you to number two. At the moment, are they more confused than is usual for them? WID stands for single question in delirium. Basically, it helps identify whether or not the confusion is an acute problem. Number three, if they are more confused than usual, try to establish when this started, as it may help you pinpoint a trigger. Sudden onset is relative when talking about confusion. It normally means over the last few days rather than a few weeks or few months. Number four, ask whether anything has changed recently. This might be medications, new accommodation, different carers, a different bowel habit, anything that could be causing pain. Even small changes can be significant. Number five, for people in hospital, it's good to get an accurate social history really early on. Hospitals are not always the best places for people with delirium if they don't need to be there for another reason. So planning how they can be discharged back to their usual place where they usually live uh, should be started as soon as possible with the aim of getting them back to a familiar environment. We've mentioned the word delirium a couple of times now, but what does it mean? So it's another term for acute confusional state essentially. So the NICE guideline definition gives three key characteristics of delirium. The first is a disturbance of conscious level, cognitive function or perception. Secondly, it's got to have an acute onset. And thirdly, it's got to have a fluctuating course. So for example, people may change between being hyperactive, which is one type of delirium, and hypoactive, which is another type of delirium. They may be better or worse at different times of the day. But whatever, the problem is normally in the cognitive domain of attention. Delirium also has significant consequences, so it should be addressed with the same urgency as any acute medical issue. For hospital inpatients, for example, it results in increased length of stay, increased mortality and worse physical and cognitive recovery. So it's really important that we take it seriously, I suppose. So a quick word on BPSD, or behavioural and psychological symptoms of dementia. In people who are living with dementia, these symptoms can sometimes be really hard to differentiate from delirium, but these five questions can help you to tell the difference. Um, so BPSD is far more likely if you answer yes to all five of these questions. So does the person have known dementia? Is it in the severe stages? Are the behaviours present for more than just a short period? Has a physical cause been ruled out? And is there a significant persistent agitation, psychosis or apathy? We've previously done a full podcast episode as part of the MDT series on BPSD and several on and, uh, dementia and delirium. I will put links to those uh, below the video. So assessing somebody who's confused, um, this should be done in much the same way as for any acute medical problem. 
the 4AT is a really quick test that can be found online. And it's easier to do than the 10 question AMTS, which is more for dementia screening really. And it can be repeated to monitor progress. Another good thing about it is it's pretty objective. So that's useful when there's frequent handover between shifts and different members of the MDT. And as well as assessing the confusion itself, you'll want to carry out a full physical examination to try and establish the underlying cause. Some important things to look for would be signs of infection, pain or sensory deficits, in particular problems with hearing or vision. Make sure you do a full medication review, particularly looking at any new drugs and any with anticholinergic properties. We've done a separate mini episode on polypharmacy and there's a whole MDT full episode on polypharmacy with some tips as to how to approach these medication reviews. Your investigations are going to be guided by your history and your examination. But if they're not really offering you many clues in terms of an underlying pathology, you'll want to get a few basic checks done. The first is thinking about some blood tests, looking for evidence of electrolyte imbalance, particularly sodium and calcium, thyroid dysfunction, uh, dysfunction and evidence of any infection. Remember, as we said previously, to check a blood glucose early on. Try and send blood cultures um, and cultures of anything you can if you think there may be an infection. A chest x-ray is useful, uh, particularly in people with respiratory symptoms, but also if people uh, can still be useful in people without respiratory symptoms. You may pick up uh, some findings to help you to piece together a diagnosis, such as a lung cancer or an unresolved infection. Anyone that has had a, a fall with a head injury or has new neurological signs will need a CT scan of the brain. But even if there are no acute findings, you may see some significant chronic changes which could help you uh, piece together um, if there's a longer term confusion, what the cause may be, but also why this person has developed their delirium and why they've been particularly at risk. So managing delirium is largely centred around removing any potential triggers and any exacerbating factors. So reorientation and having a calm environment is something that is really important and can involve lots of different things. For example, verbal reminders of where they are and why, but doing that calmly in a non-combative manner. Encouraging a normal sleep routine and pattern, um, bearing in mind that you need to check what's normal for them. Do they go to bed early? Do they get up early? Um, appropriate lighting in the environment can help with that to signal clearly what is daytime and when is nighttime. Creating routines, so getting them up and dressed in the morning if they're well enough to do so and that's safe to do. Um, and eating meals out of the chair at a table and things like that to try and address uh, normality as much as possible. Trying to look for any unmet needs is really important. Even if someone's confused, you can usually still try asking them what they want and try and understand what's driving the behaviour um, that they're exhibiting. There might be really simple things as understanding the patterns of when they need the toilet, um, when they might be in pain, that might be exacerbating the situation that can be really easily resolved. Having a familiar face around can be really, really helpful, although that's obviously difficult at times, in particular during this COVID crisis where there's limitations on visiting, that can be really quite difficult to achieve. So it's really important we try and find out a bit of that person, their personal preferences, their likes, their dislikes. So if their families and, and their uh, relatives and friends can't be there, that you can at least understand some of those normal things for that person as a person. People with dementia will quite often have a this is me document and if they don't, we'd encourage you to write one and that's a way to document some of these bits of information. You will get lots of that from the collateral history. If you don't have it, then seek it out so you can better look after this person and help the whole team to look after that person as well. And treating the underlying problem may also involve removing something like a problematic drug or it might involve giving antibiotics or electrolyte replacement, for example. Things to avoid in delirium include sedation, although this is sometimes appropriate in specific situations, such as to prevent somebody from harming themselves or harming other people. Anything restrictive should be avoided, really, um, including catheters, which often get pulled out anyway and can act as an inroad for infection. 
and cot sides can cause distress and can also result in a worse fall if somebody tries to climb over them. Where possible, the number of ward transfers and room changes should be kept to a minimum, although this can be difficult sometimes in hospital. A really important thing to be aware of with delirium is that it can take a long time to resolve, anything from a few days to even a few months. This means that people who have delirium in hospital will often need to be discharged before their confusion has completely gone away. In fact, most people start to recover much more quickly once they're back in their usual familiar environment. Some people though may not return exactly ha to how they were before, especially if they've got some underlying progressive neuropathology or they've had a particularly severe delirium with lots of neuroinflammation. It's worth noting too that those who've had episodes of delirium are more likely to be diagnosed with a dementia in the next few months and those who have dementia are more likely to become delirious when they're unwell. Their cognitive reserve is less. Um, it stands to reason that these negative things may happen uh, when they're unwell. If you suspect someone might have dementia, they may benefit from a more formal assessment from a memory clinic once the delirium has resolved. So if you head over to our website, www.thehearingaidpodcast.org.uk, you'll find a full podcast episode on delirium. So that's in series one, episode two. Uh, we've also got a couple of episodes on things like BPSD, so behaviour and psychological symptoms of dementia that we discussed earlier. Um, the MDT podcast and lots of the other learning resources that are on the website are free to use um, and they cover a wide range of topics concerning older adults, so from mouth care to music therapy. You can also check out the rest of this mini series for more bite sized learning. We hope that this episode of Help has been a help. Bye. Bye.